Hello and welcome. Today on Relentless Renewal, I would like to welcome Philipp Hornbach, Chief AI Officer at Schneider Air Electric. When it comes to AI innovators, for me, Schneider Electric is at the top of the list, especially when it comes to implementing AI at scale. Philippe was appointed as the company's first Chief AI Officer more than two years ago, quite a good foresight. Since that time, he has implemented an AI hub and spoke global, uh, operating model at a global scale, which applies different technologies like, like Microsoft Azure and open source components. I'm so pleased to have Philippe here to tell us more about what Nadea Electric has been doing with AI and how he and his team are scaling their AI capabilities to new levels. Philippe, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dominic, for inviting me and for those very kind words. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Philippe. So to get us started, you have more than 20 years of experience in strategy, innovation, um, and business responsibilities across many industries. It's more than half of your career spent at Schneider Electric. Tell us a bit more about, you know, what got you here and um, what's happening at Schneider and, you know, what you're most excited about in your role as Chief AI Officer. Yeah, good question. So first, maybe what I would start with is I am not an AI specialist. I am not even a data specialist and not even a software specialist. Uh, all through my career, I had like general business responsibility, leading P&L, either in sales or in offer creation. And uh, yeah, I joined Schneider 12 years ago, I think, like many of us, uh, when Schneider made an acquisition. And I stayed because I think I like the, the way Schneider works and uh, their focus on sustainability. Uh, and if I come on your second question on what excites me most, a lot of things are exciting about AI, obviously. I think one of the key things is this is maybe the only technology where you can apply in the real world at scale, extremely new developments. Look at Gen AI. The fundamental paper, I think, was published in 2017. Everybody can use it at scale five years later. Things about physics or mathematics, it takes ages to go from labs to reality. AI is fast, so you are able to use new tech almost immediately at scale for the business and for the industry. That's exciting. Okay, I can I can absolutely see that. And we are sharing very similar experiences here. So um, and from what you've seen, like why, I mean, why do companies need AI in the first place? It's a good question. And I would say that first, AI can help a lot, most of the companies to be more efficient. Uh, since now a few years, if not more, companies have done a lot of work on digitizing, building data, storing data, and using AI is really now the next step to go for more efficiency in leveraging this accumulated data, this accumulated kind of knowledge. So the first thing I would say is AI can really help uh, to improve uh, Generally speaking, the efficiency of custom of company, the customer support, the customer service, all of that. The second thing, and this is probably more uh, related to Schneider, is when we look at the needs to address climate change, the need to decarbonize, we will need to optimize quite complex processes around energy management, around the new grid with a lot of distributed energy resources. And all of that becomes so complicated that you cannot build anymore physical models, or you cannot build any more first principle models, you have to use AI to modelize, optimize all of that. So energy transition, from my point of view, will need AI to be implemented because of the sheer complexity of the distributed consumer uh, producers, etc. So two things for all companies, really improving efficiency, improving customer support, customer satisfaction. For us, the specific need around optimization, digitization, electrification. And uh, and maybe as a joke, I think the question may not be, do you need AI? I mean, in 10 years from now, every company will use extensively AI, I think. The question is more, do you want to be among the first or among the last? But at the end, everybody will leverage AI. On your last point, indeed, I think like everybody is... is um looking at the opportunity now. I think where we see quite some differences working with our customers is the, the speed at which companies manage to scale. And given you, you, know, you and your company have started on that journey very on, I mean, would you mind sharing some learnings on like, how did you manage to scale up quickly at uh, Schneider Electric? 
Yeah, that's a good, that's a very important question because obviously it's relatively easy, not super easy, but relatively easy, especially with generative AI to do pilots, to do proof of concept. The difficulty is how do you make it at scale? How do you really impact your company? How do you transform your company and so on? Uh, and maybe I will start with, uh, with a small joke. As I said, I'm not an AI specialist, although I learn a lot, but when our CEO called me, when he created this position of chief AI officer, I asked him why me? Again, not AI specialist, not of specialist. And he said, I think I need three qualities. And I think this is valid for all companies. I need somebody who understand our business to choose the good use cases for our company. And that's, I need somebody who understand our company because infusing AI across Schneider will not be easy. And you need to understand how Schneider works, how Schneider operates. And third, you have some uh, mathematical background uh, core education, so you should be able to learn enough to understand. And I think, you know, this understanding the business, understanding the company, being able to learn enough to understand a bit how AI works is probably three important things when you build your organization. Then the second thing that we did is really from day one to say, we will not focus on doing pilots and then try to scale. From day one, we started from the use case and our hub and spoke model is, is the following. We created a strong central team of AI specialists because today it is still quite new and complex technology and you cannot build it everywhere. We can come back later on that, but we created a strong AI team. And then we work on a hub and spoke model, which means that we always start from the use case. We always start from the benefit. What does it bring to the customer? What does it bring to our internal organization? What does it bring uh, for against climate change? We start from the use case, and these use case are the business value or customer value. And then we create a team merging people specialists from AI and people specialists of the business or the organization. And that squad, in a pure agile sense, is responsible to deliver the use case at scale, which means that their job is not to make a POC or an MVP. Their job is to implement and deploy at scale the solution. So typically, that means that, of course, we do MVPs, we do POCs, we are not better than other people, we need to check. But from the very beginning, the team has all the skills needed to bring it at scale. And from the very beginning, thinks the project, the way we develop the use case with the at scale deployment. And the squad is done only when the project is fully deployed, fully utilized, fully integrated. So that's probably the core of the core. And then a few things around that is we don't do new AI projects. We do always AI features embedded in our existing solutions and our existing uh, products uh, so that we don't need to create a new go-to-market, a new adoption plan, all of that. We can leverage what is existing and we improve what we do uh, with AI. So a long answer, I could spend hours on that, but fundamentally, start from the use case, start from the business, a joint squad team with strong AI knowledge, strong business knowledge, in charge of delivering until the project is fully deployed at scale. I think it's very interesting. And I also have to say, I think with most of our customers, the, the core struggle is not the technology, right? You can master the technology. The core question is like, you know, how do you deal with all the organizational challenges of, of scaling up? And um, I love that framing of the hub and spoke model that you describe. I imagine then with the hub part of it, you probably have more demand than you have capacity. Like, how do you go about prioritizing the initiatives that you want to pursue? So that's a very good question. And what we do is we, we have developed a process, nothing super fancy, that goes from ideation until uh, operation through, um, through, of course, industrialization and so on. And we always check two things from the beginning, which is, do we have a technical feasibility? which means do we have the data to do the solution? Do we have the algorithm to do it? Can we reach what the business needs? And also, are we comfortable that we'll be able to deliver the value, the business plan that was planned at the start of the use case? Which means that each gate review, and we have five gate reviews, but could have more, could have less, we really check two things. Can we do it technically? And can we deliver the value? And we stop use cases either because we cannot do it, that happens, of course, or because the business value is not confirmed, is not there anymore, we are not sure for whatever reason. And I think keeping those two, the good way to sort, not only sort on, can I do it technically, but also do I confirm that I will be able to bring the business value 
that was committed at the beginning of the use case. So that's how we sort basically by, by business value primarily. That makes sense. What's the organization acceptance you find? I mean, clearly, I'm, I mean, I'm sure the people on your team by kind of, you know, self-selection, they all are very excited about AI, but like, how, how does the business at large, you know, accept the technology and, and how are you going about, you know, basically putting people in a, in a position where they can make use of the technology? I would say two, two, two things which are very important. We always really start from a business need uh, and mm -hmm. translate it into resources and people committed to join this squad team. If we don't have that, we don't start it. Mm -hmm. So we always start where there is a need. So what we try to avoid is to be in a technology push, but more mm -hmm. in a technology pool. So what we do is we have even created two small teams whose job is to sit for one of them with our functions like supply chain, HR, finance. For the other mm -hmm. one, it was our line of businesses where we develop offers and really start not from AI, but start from what is the need? What is the difficulty? What are the things you want to achieve? And together identify where AI can help. And by mm -hmm. doing that, you start in a pool mode, in a demand mode, and AI comes as a solution to an existing problem rather than as a technology looking for a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helps a lot with, with the adoption. Mm -hmm. This being said, of course, adoption is always uh, an issue, a difficulty when you do any kind of transformation, AI or not AI. And, and one should never forget the usual things to do to ensure adoption about training, explanation, adoption, all of that, of course. I love your phrase of the technology pull versus the technology push. I think that's a, a great summary. So if you don't mind, I mean, could you share some specific examples of, you know, particularly exciting projects we're working on together? You won't be surprised, of course, that I choose examples which are customer focused and, uh, and climate focused. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I will give maybe two or three examples. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one is we have an offer uh, called Resource Advisor that helps our customers to really understand where, where do their carbon emission come from, uh, how do they monitor it, and so on. We have built as Schneider a resource co-pilot which makes it easy for customers to interrogate the software in natural language, as you know. So they can say, what was my carbon emission from last year? And then, okay, can you refine that by geography, by factory, by whatever? So one thing which I like a lot, making for each company is easier to, to, to understand where the carbon emissions come from. And maybe another one really focused also on sustainability. And this one is a bit complicated to explain, but let's try. Uh, in a world where people have moved massively to renewable, you will have a lot of what we call prosumer. So people who both have the capacity to generate electricity, like having solar panels on the roof and maybe batteries in the basement. And also, of course, they consume electricity because they have a process. The process can be heating of a building or operating a factory or a data center, whatever it is. Of course, if you use the energy produced by your solar panels, it's great already, it's green, but you can do better. If you are able to forecast your need of energy, know what will be the carbon content of the electricity in the coming days, then you can start to do much more than just use your electricity. You can start to optimize. And maybe today, it's going to be better to sell the energy produced by your panels to the grid instead of using it. Or it'll be better to store it in your battery because tomorrow you will, you will need a lot of energy and the energy coming from the grid will be extremely carbonated. And to do that, you need actually a lot of AI. You need, a, you need AI to forecast your consumption. You need AI, when you know your forecast, to optimize this relatively complex setup of different source of production and different consumer. And you even need AI, for example, if you go one level next, to optimize your data coming in because sometimes a sensor will fail, sometimes, and then you need AI to correct that. So you need AI at many levels for anomaly detection, optimization, and forecasting if you want to fully optimize uh, a prosumer, so somebody having solar panels, wind generation, batteries, and connected to the grid. So I know the minute it is too complicated, but this energy transition will not happen without AI because nobody will every 15 minutes look at it and say, hey, I would better buy or sell or use. This has to be automated, and this has to be automated through AI. So when, just to clarify, when you talk about the prosumer, are these companies or could that also be me like as a private household would i be optimizing my energy 
consumption and production in a similar manner? Every level. We can start at home level up to large building levels, up to university sites levels, up to district level. Today in Schneider, we have solutions for home level, large building levels, and even, even central district heating systems. So that should be done at every level. And in a world where today it is not feasible for plenty of reasons, but if we could share all this data from all these levels, we could go to the next level of optimization. But already optimizing each will bring a lot. I love that. I would love to do that in my house. <laughs> so maybe you can go back and tell you what to use. What's your outlook in the next five and, and 10 years? Like, how do you think, you know, what, what are the next things to come? I would say that, and maybe I'm, uh, I'm overly excited by AI, but the energy transition, the fight against climate change will not happen without AI. And I see AI playing a key role around three axes. The first one is quite Obvious, if you use less energy for the same outcome, even if that energy is carbonated, like oil or gas or, or coal, of course, you will emit less carbon. So here, AI can already first help by reducing the energy consumption by optimizing. Clearly, AI will be critical in the new world of energy, and AI will be super important to decarbonize and fight against climate change. And I see it playing at three levels. The first one is obviously by being part of the digi digitization journey to use AI to optimize the energy consumption. If you can use less energy for the same outcome, even if that energy is carbonated, of course, you emit less carbon. So here we are in the traditional optimizing forecasting capacities of AI. That's one thing. But then even if you have fully optimized your process to reduce your energy consumption thanks to digitization and AI, the only energy that can be fully decarbonized is obviously electricity. Mm -hmm. And if you move to electricity, if you really want to positively impact the planet, you need to use green electricity. I mean, obviously, if your electricity is produced by burning oil or gas or coal, you're back to square one. And that's becoming a bit compli complicated, but to make it as simple as I can, energy, the, the dilemma with electricity is that you cannot really store it or very few, and therefore you need to balance demand and production. And when demand goes high, what we call the peak of demand, what utilities do is they start gas power power station or coal power power station because they are easy and fast to start. So if you can avoid this peak of demand, then of course, uh, you can reduce a lot of the carbon content of electricity. So AI will be used also to reduce its peak of demand, as in the example of prosumer that I was giving before, where by using forecasting capacities of AI and optimization capacities of AI, you become able to average your demand. So first, you reduce your demand by optimizing. Then using AI, you average your demand to reduce the peak and therefore enable you to use clean, green electricity as much as possible. So those are the first two axes, and I told you three. The third one is, let's imagine a world where you have solutions to optimize your energy consumption, solutions to remove the peak of demand of electricity and therefore use green electricity. If those solutions are not widely used, and you mentioned your home not equipped yet, then you haven't made much progress. So the third part of AI is lower the barrier for adoption, makes it easier to use AI. And I will give an example of something we have developed uh, with one of our company called Tumerit, based in the US. California is pushing very hard to equip all homes with solar panels on the roof. The first step to do that is to have an electrician coming to your home, checking if your electrical installation is able to accept these solar panels. You don't have enough electricians, that slows down the deployment. We have built an AI solution where you simply open your electrical panel, take a picture with your phone, upload it, and you save the mm -hmm. first bit of the electrician, and therefore you remove one barrier to entry. So three things clearly for energy management, reduce your energy, help move to electricity by removing the peak, and remove the barriers to entry by making a lot of the things much more easier to adopt. That's what I see as a key role for AI energy optimization in the, in the next five years. That makes a lot of sense. 
And how do you envision the future of your your role and your organization in at Schneider Electric in, in that context? A very good question. So we made that choice to have a separated team with AI specialists and then creating, working in this Hubble spoke model. The question could be, should we have these teams now back to all, to all line of businesses and all function? At this stage, technology is moving so fast that I still believe that it's better to have a third-fold team. But we always should challenge ourselves every year of, does it make sense? Or is it now mature enough that we just should see that as a usual thing? Today, again, moving too fast, too many questions around um, responsible AI, uh, too many questions about doing it in, a, in, in, a, in an honest and responsible way that I still believe it makes sense uh, to keep it centralized uh, mm -hmm. and working in this heaven's work model. But, but the question could be open, and for me, it's also depending on each company culture. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, the last thing I would say is, because organization is one thing, but if you look at the future of AI, I would say actually AI is part of our strategy and it's not really a revolution, it's a next step. I mean, we have always helped our customers to be more efficient by more digitization and by more electrification. And as shared before, AI is a key contributor, a key enabler, both to the digitization and to the electrification. So AI for me really comes as the next step in our long journey of helping our customers to be more sustainable by being more efficient and to do that by being more digital and more electrical. That's a great summary. Well, thank you, Philippe. I mean, thank you for being such a great partner with Microsoft. We really enjoy working together with you and your team. And thank you for the, the very insightful conversation today. Um, I have to say I'm very excited about, you know, what you're doing in the space, how you're combining AI and sustainability. And thanks a lot for joining us today. Dominique, my turn to thank you both for the invitation and the great collaboration with your teams. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to do AI together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philippe. Bye-bye.